you told me three years ago that I'd be where I am now, I wouldn't have believed you. Things have changed a lot recently, and they say that there's a semiconductor shortage going on. I wouldn't have known, though. I've got more semiconductors here than I know what to do with. But it wasn't always this way. When I first started out, I didn't have anyone to tell me that semiconductors are more than just processors and GPUs. It all started with a single transistor. A transistor is an electrical component that can be used to switch or amplify electrical signals. Back in the day, I'd crank them open and see that each one contained a small piece of a silvery material that I couldn't identify. This silvery material was sandwiched between the metal pins of the transistor and the epoxy packaging. That's where the magic is. When I started to look more closely, I thought to myself, hey, that looks just like a piece of silicon, the world's most famous semiconductor material. This got me curious, and I started to wonder what other objects had semiconductors inside of them. Next, I took a small flash memory card and very carefully smashed it open with a hammer. Inside, I found that it contained a small silicon chip. The silicon die of a flash memory chip looks fairly uniform, with a small amount of detail around the edges. The detailed part on the edges of the chip contains the logic for reading and writing the stored data. The larger and more uniform area in the center contains billions of tiny features that actually store the data. Eventually, I started to build confidence in myself, and I found that other components have semiconductors inside of them too. My mind was starting to race, and I began to imagine a brightly lit future for myself. So I gathered all of my favorite LED lights together and switched them on so I could see what great fortunes were waiting for me. But then I wondered, what are these LEDs made of? And so I began to extensively research the topic, and what I found absolutely blew my mind. Apparently, LEDs are made of gallium arsenide. I figured that must be just a very smelly version of gallium, but then I saw the S word. On that day, things changed forever as soon as I saw the word semiconductor. When I found that LEDs are also made of semiconductors, I got so excited that I decided to take a break and play around with my collection of solar cells. Solar cells make use of the photovoltaic effect to convert light into electricity. I found that when I put my solar cell close to the light source, the open circuit voltage that was measured by this multimeter increased. When I moved the solar cell further away, the voltage would decrease. I wondered to myself, what kind of magical material could these solar cells be made of? You're not going to believe this, but it turns out that solar cells are also made of semiconductors. I was starting to get overwhelmed by this semiconductor nonsense, so I turned my attention to something that I knew wouldn't have any semiconductors inside of it. This is an old power supply from one of my servers. It's full of non-semiconductor materials, like aluminum heat sinks and ferrite inductors. After looking through it carefully, I realized that it's full of power regulators and small chips. Most of these chips don't do any computation, but they also contain semiconductors too. You just can't get away from these things, can you? I got so overwhelmed by these semiconductors that I started feeling frustrated and angry. So angry that I decided it would be a good idea to check my temperature with one of these DS18B20 thermal probes. But then I wondered, what are these temperature sensors even made of? So I cut one of them open with a hacksaw, and there it was, just hanging out like it was no big deal. A semiconductor. It was beginning to feel like everything around me was made of semiconductors. I even made a joke that even my camera was probably made of semiconductors. Turns out, it actually was. It uses a CMOS image sensor to detect light using an array of pixel-sized photo detectors. The pixels are made to be sensitive to different colors and arranged in a Bayer filter pattern so that color information can be reconstructed in the final image. After learning about image sensors, I discovered something amazing, a high-sensitivity photodiode. This photodiode was able to convert light into electricity, even in a dimly lit room. To get some data points, I measured its open circuit voltage under a lamp 
and the value on the multimeter displayed 320 millivolts. Then, I measured its short circuit current, and the multimeter showed a value of 41 microamps. Then, I turned the lamp off and repeated the measurements. With the lamp off, the multimeter showed a value of 274 millivolts for the open circuit voltage, and a value of 8 microamps for the short circuit current. The next logical step was to solder 10 of them in series and see how long it would take them to charge up this 2200 microfarad capacitor. I did this experiment on a gloomy and cloudy winter day, and the process of charging up the capacitor took about 45 minutes. After charging up the capacitor, I was able to briefly flash this 0.5 watt LED using the stored energy generated by the photodiode. These photodiodes work just like mini solar cells. At this point, I was really starting to feel like I was on a roll. With the sun shining high in the sky, lighting up my solar cells and photodiodes, I felt like I was invincible. But then I started to get a bit carried away with my semiconductors. It started out innocently with clean and pure monosilicon. These monocrystals are produced by a process called the Szokralski method. A seed monocrystal is dipped into a vat of molten silicon and slowly pulled out, causing cooled silicon to arrange itself in the same crystal structure as the seed crystal. Eventually, I ended up trying out some macro-etched silicon too. This macro-etched silicon has a less uniform crystal structure, which has been made clearly visible by an acid etching process. After a while, all I could find was busted up bits of polysilicon, of unknown concentration and origin. I even messed around with dendritic silicon, which is formed by a complex physical interaction of temperature and surface area of the partially molten crystal. Then one day, I was offered some quartz crystals, which are mostly just impure silicon dioxide. This was when I knew I had hit rock bottom. I was starting to develop a problem, and I needed to make a change before it became a major issue. It was time to go back to the basics. So I took 65 meters of 30 gauge enameled copper wire and I put it in my freezer. This copper wire was exactly what I needed to start making sense of my life. But first, I had to keep it in the freezer until its temperature was just below freezing. Then, after it had cooled down, I removed it and measured its electrical resistance. As the copper wire warmed up, its electrical resistance, as measured by the multimeter, increased from 22.8 ohms to 24.8 ohms. Then, I repeated the process using a chunk of pure silicon. What happened next was something I never could have expected. Just as before, I first let the silicon cool down in the freezer and then removed it. As the silicon heated up, its measured electrical resistance decreased from 100 kilo ohms to 30 kilo ohms. This was the proof that I needed to show the world the true power of semiconductors. I had to think about this and get it right before I went any further. For a semiconductor, the electrical resistance decreases when the temperature increases. But for a regular conductor, the opposite is true. In that moment, I knew I was back in business. But this time, I had to get serious. I had to keep myself clean and be as straight edge as possible. To keep clean, I used an ISO 14644-1 class 5 clean room with a maximum airborne particle concentration of 832 1 micron particles per cubic meter. This ultra clean air was just what I needed to prevent tiny particles from interfering with the development of my semiconductor devices. Being straight edge was more difficult, but I persevered and produced one of the straightest edges that human beings can produce using a process called epitaxy to slowly deposit a fresh layer of silicon one atom at a time onto a thin slice of a silicon monocrystal. The result was a brand new and totally blank silicon wafer. Each wafer undergoes surface pacification to keep it fresh and clean. The surface pacification involves coating the wafer with a thin oxide layer to prevent chemical reactions with the atmosphere. This was a happy and colorful period in my life. There's no better feeling than starting a brand new day with a warm cup of coffee 
and a freshly polished and epitaxially coated silicon wafer. After I finished my morning coffee, I'd spent hours marveling at the colored patterns that were generated by thin film interference and diffraction of light as it scattered through the thin oxide layers on the surface of the silicon wafer. It may be hard to believe, but you can tell a lot about the thickness of an oxide layer and the color of light that it generates at a given viewing angle. When lunchtime rolled around, I'd have the usual, a sandwich. After lunch, I'd also continue with the sandwich. An epitaxial sandwich of oxides and copper interconnect layers, that is. These copper interconnect layers are embedded within the chip to electrically connect the individual circuit components within the chip itself. It turns out that the copper interconnects inside of a silicon chip work a lot like the copper traces on a printed circuit board. By late afternoon, Grandma would always stop by and help us conjure up a fresh batch of wafers. Each silicon die was made with love and carefully cut to consider the crystal plane orientation of the underlying wafer substrate. Like Grandma always used to say, the anisotropic properties of silicon requires an enumeration of the Miller indices. On special occasions, we'd go for something fancier than a plain silicon wafer and use silicon on sapphire instead. Grandma's secret recipe for sapphire chips was just the right touch for radiation-hardened applications, like geostationary satellites or the inside of nuclear reactors. We always knew our computations would be safe from high-energy charged particles because they were gently wrapped inside of an insulating dielectric layer of sapphire. We had a grand old time making all kinds of chips, like this 8-bit microcontroller with 17 interrupt sources, 22 I.O. pins, an 8-bit UART, and a programmable watchdog timer. Or this 8-bit multi-channel sound controller with a clock speed of 8 MHz, a serial peripheral master interface, 1 MB of ROM, and a real-time clock. I'll never forget the fond memories of our 900 MHz cordless phone chip, featuring a phase-locked loop, an infrared detector, and a compander. It was truly an exciting period of my life. But these days, things are a bit different. The truth is, I've realized that silicon is the poor man's semiconductor. I've moved on to germanium now. Germanium is a decadent semiconductor that features a lower band gap and a higher refractive index compared to that of silicon. Germanium is also commonly used to make infrared optics, such as this infrared lens. It's also commonly used to make germanium diodes that exhibit a lower forward voltage than that of silicon diodes. Nowadays, everybody asks me, Robert, how do I become semiconductor rich just like you? The truth is, anyone can become semiconductor rich. All you need to do is believe in yourself and find your passion.